Um, and Happy New Year, yes, absolutely, to those who were not around last um, cold Sunday. <laughs> Uh, January the 1st, Happy New Year to everybody, to visitors especially, if you're trying us out, uh, or it's part of a New Year's regime, or you're just uh, hanging out with some friends this weekend, really, really welcome, and just a joy to say hi. A little, a little barren and bare, very glad that the, these lovely lights are still here, but the Christmas tree's gone down and we missed the decorations. Anybody else taken their decorations down? Anybody else like to prolong the moment and kind of keep them going? Because actually Christmas trees are really beautiful, or is it just us? Actually, ours did have to come down uh, yesterday, not like the time I was telling the staff a few years ago, quite a few years ago, when uh, in early March, Hills and I, um, before we had kids, I'd like to say, um, had a knock on the door and opened the door, and it was a policeman. True story. And, uh, he, and, he, and he sort of breathed a bit of a sigh of relief. I said, can I help you? He said, oh, that's, that's good. I said, what's good? He said, well, you're still alive. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we were just a little concerned because we've been passing this house and it's early March now, and in the front window there, you've still got your Christmas tree. <laughs> and... It's not looking in best shape. We wondered whether you weren't either. <laughs> I'd love to say there was some great spiritual reason behind it, by the way, you know, some great kind of thing about Easter, you know, my thing on Christmas Day from Christmas tree to Easter tree or something. It wasn't actually just a sign of complete neglect and disorganization on our part. And another part of the great uh, Christmas tradition, I'm sure yours too, is the argument in every household about which are the, fam which are the best Christmas films. And um, I'm not going to go down that line now. You're already beginning to think, uh, what, what Christmas film do we, did we watch? What did we enjoy? For what it's worth, our best film, not a Christmas film, but the best film of the season that we watched called A United Kingdom. I don't know if anybody's seen that. Absolutely brilliant, brilliant film about the birth of Botswana and lots of kind of Christian overtones. So I recommend that to you. But there was a big survey done. You, some of you probably saw it just recently. Which is the best film, Christmas film, as voted for by the great British public? And do you know what the win winner was? That heavyweight classic, Love Actually. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm not going to comment on that film particularly, but what I am going to do is to nick the title. Because uh, and in a great piece of communication between uh, your senior staff colleagues here, I'm not actually going to start the new series, uh, sermon series this week. That begins next week, David. Um, <laughs> LAUGHTER But I could sort of pretend that it does, <laughs> if you like. Because I'm going to talk about God, and I'm going to talk about love, uh, and we're going to talk about Jesus. And actually, even as, as I say that, if you hear no other word, I, I love what David did earlier. I love that sense of the Lord with us at the beginning of this year, and just gathering again in his name, in his presence, around the name and the beauty and the character and the love of Jesus. And if we leave with nothing else today but a revived sense of the beauty and the love and the grace of the one in whose name we gather, then we will do well. We will do well. Let the name of Jesus be on our lips and in our, in our lives. And I hope this message contributes something to that. <clears throat> I'm going to twist the uh, title a little bit uh, and call the talk First Love, actually, uh, if you want a, a, a theme for it. I felt the Lord tell me to start here with what is, after all, a completely underlying and overarching and all-embracing mind stretching, heart-expanding, little, innocent-sounding word called love. And we need to begin there because that's where God begins. At the beginning of the year, it may be that you're a resolution person, it may be that you're not, but I reckon that a lot of people stand back around this time of year, reflect a little bit, look forward a little bit, try and understand a bit more what matters more, what matters less, maybe put some priorities in place, refresh some things that we think are important. And if we want to understand what's really important, if we want to step back collectively as a church family uh, at the beginning of 2017 and go, what really matters to us? We have to start with God. Of course we do. We can't understand what we're about fundamentally unless we begin with him because he's the one who made us. If we want to understand that life is more than just getting from cradle to grave as best we can, we have to begin with God because he created us. You, so you can't tell yourself what you're made for. Nobody can do that. Only our creator can tell us what we're made for. And what we're made for begins in the nature of God. And the Bible says, and we believe, God is love. That's his nature. It's who he is. Not just that he has love, not just that he shows love, but that God is love. 
That's his essence. And the only reason that you and I are able to love, to give and to receive love is because we're made in the image of that creator God. Ants can't love. Sorry if you're an ant lover. Snails can't love. Cows can't love. Only humans can love. Why? Because we're made in the image of the one who is love. And we're created as the objects of that love. I wonder if you felt a fresh sense yet of the love of God this year, whether that's something that you're craving. We're made for love. The reason that God made us. We need to get our heads around this and our hearts around it all the time, I think. The reason that he made us is this. He made us to love us. He made us to love us. It's the reason that we're here, so that we could experience that love, so that he could express it. We're going to spend a little bit of time in Ephesians today. Some of my scriptures come from uh, the book of Ephesians and and writings about the Ephesians. And I I love to think uh, of a resonance between Ephesus and Cheltenham. You've heard me say that before. Whenever I read Ephesians, there's a particular uh, sort of underlining, because I think there's a lot of similarities uh, between the two places, actually, tra- centers of commerce and trade and places of education and civilization, places of uh, ideas, um, places of great disparity between wealth and deprivation as well as in our own town, and a whole number of, of other things. If you know about Ephesus, I won't r- remind us too much. But when uh, Paul writes to uh, the Ephesians, we need to take, take note, and we do, and here, here God says in Ephesians 1, long ago, Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us. And we stop right there. God loved us and chose us before he even created the universe. He had already chosen you and loved you. You there, you, whatever your name is, put your name in that blank, loved you. God chose you and loved you before he created anything else. He made the universe so that he could make the earth. He made the earth so that he could make people. He made people so that he could make us, so that he could love us. Before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his family by bringing us to himself through Jesus. And this gave him great pleasure. God takes pleasure in loving us. The primary first purpose of my life is to be loved by God. Let that sink in again at the start of this year. The primary purpose of your life is to be loved loved by God, even before it's to do anything, even before it's to to give love, even before it's to worship or to serve or to respond or to obey or to do anything like that. Our first purpose is to receive something, not to learn something, not to listen to something, not to pray, not to give, not to sacrifice, not to serve. They're all good. They're massively good and important. But to receive the love of God is your primary purpose for being alive. And we have to start there because it's so big and so massive and so important. So if I were to ask, what is the biggest problem, do you think, on the planet? And there are many, so many, so many. Oh, my goodness. Our screens are so full of problems. Our lives are so full of issues and challenges. Our town as well. What is the biggest issue that we face, the biggest problem? Actually, it's this. It's not even that we don't love God enough. I'm going to come on to that in a minute. It's actually that we don't understand and experience how much he loves us. Paul goes on to pray for that Ephesian church, for this Cheltenham church this morning. I pray that Jesus Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts as you trust him. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's love. What an incredible prayer to have prayed over you and to pray over somebody else. Can we make that one of our prayers this year? May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you have power to understand, as all of God's people should, how wide and long and high and deep his love really is. And may you experience this love of Jesus Christ. Not just know it, not just assent to it as a bit of propositional truth, but experience it, know it, encounter it. Experience the love of Jesus. Though it's so great, you'll never fully comprehend it. Like a wasp trying to understand the internet, somebody said. So wide, so long, so high, so deep. Wide enough to be everywhere, to encompass everybody. Long enough to last forever, never runs out. Deep enough to handle anything. Some of us going through the deepest kind of winter at the moment, or pain. The love of Christ, deep enough for that. High enough to handle anything, to deal with all of my own selfishness. God says this, I've always loved you. 
There's never been a moment of your existence that I haven't known you and loved you, called you by name. And we have to start there, and I would love to dwell there more. But just let me say this, the more that we get that, the more that we allow for this truth to sink from head to heart, the more that we allow our hearts to be refreshed and renewed and for roots to go down deep into that love, the more it is a life changer. It really is a life changer. So many people will be starting this year wanting for their lives to change. You as well, I expect. You don't want to stay the same. You don't want your circumstances maybe to stay the same. That's a harder thing. God doesn't always change our circumstances, but he's always looking to change us. And many of us are going, yeah, amen, I'd love to change. What is a life changer? Well, fundamentally, the biggest life changer of all is that we get this, that we get the love of God, that we embrace the love of God, that we encounter the love of God, that we're aware deeper and deeper of the love of God, and that becomes our identity, our main identity. I heard a football manager on the radio yesterday um, talking, Premier League football manager, and he said, first and foremost, I'm a football manager. That's what my life's about. It's what I spend most of my days thinking about and working for. That's just who I am. He said, that's just who I am. And it caught my attention. That's just who I am. Who are you? For all the identities that we wear, husband, father, Arsenal supporter, it's a great identity, a whole bunch of other identities. Chocolate lover, I know somebody whose identity is, that's quite high up her list. (laughs) But if my top sense of identity is that I am loved by God, I'm a son or a daughter of a heavenly father who loves me, that's a life changer. That will impact everything more and more. We can feel accepted, we can feel secure, we can cope somehow with the pain that life throws at us because the bigger picture still is of a God who loves us and on and on. And we get to respond to it to come to where I want to go this morning and and to the encouragement to the Ephesian church. We get to respond to that love. It's only because he loves us that we can begin to love him. But love him we must. That's our response. So the deeper my personal awareness and encounter with the love of God through Jesus by his spirit, the deeper my response will begin to be to learn to love him in return. So here we are, the start of 2017, I'm reminding us, God himself I think is reminding us, he loves us and we are to love him. Tim, couldn't you say something a bit more interesting, a bit more kind of uh, creative, a bit more imaginative than that? No, actually, there is nothing more beautiful and creative and life-giving than that, that you are loved by God and that the call is to respond to that by loving him back. First, love, actually. If only it were so automatic. Stuff gets in the way. We're all going, yeah, oh man, I'd love to love, love God more, but there's stuff in the way. The world, the flesh, the devil gets in the way. Here's the reminder by way of command, actually, encouragement, Deuteronomy 6.5. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of it, all of your soul, all of it, all of your strength, all of it. Jesus adds all of your mind, if you remember. With all that you are, all that you have, you shall have no other gods before me, no room for divided affections or allegiance. The one supreme, all-powerful, all-loving God makes this urgent call upon us for our sake and his, that we'd love. And of course, we struggle with this. We struggle with having... God at the top of the tree of love, as it were. I know that even in the room now, there'll be people thinking, love God really more than I love my wife or husband, more than I love my kids, more than I love my parents, really? Let alone more than I love chocolate or Arsenal. But love God more than all of those, really? I find that hard. Let's remind ourselves that the, the pie of love is not a finite one, as if... Uh, We give more love there. There's only this much love to go here. It doesn't work like that. If we first love God, actually, he gives us more love for spouse and friend and neighbor. The pie is not limited. C.S. Lewis puts it brilliantly like this. I love this quote. If we put second things first, we lose both, both first and second things. But if we put first things first, first love, actually, first love God, actually, then we get second things thrown in. And he elaborated this. I hadn't come across this, but as I was reading, I I did. He elaborates that quote, which addresses the point I've just made about how can we love God more than we love even uh, our family and those closest to us. 
To love you as I should, I must first worship God and love him. When I've learned to love God better than, uh, sorry, when I've learned to love God better than my earthly dearest, even my wife, I shall love my earthly dearest better than I do now. So you want to love your kids more at the start of this year? You want to love your parents more? You want to love your friends more? Love God more first. That's how it works. In so, C.S. Lewis goes on, insofar as I learn to love my earthly dearest at the expense of God or instead of God, I shall be moving towards not loving my earthly dearest at all. When first things are put first, second things are not suppressed, they're increased. Love that. So let's return to the Ephesian church and to how they got on. They started so well. You probably remember that. Uh, Aquila and Priscilla were those who were involved in some kind of early Bible study group. And Paul comes along and the, the, the wind of the Holy Spirit breathes into that community. And life happens and the community begins to start and grow and flourish. Timothy visits them as well. And they're commended for all kinds of things. They're warned that they'll come under all kinds of pressure. That their love for God will come under pressure. Internal pressure, external pressure from others. That following Jesus is going to be a hard gig. That's what Paul's letter, uh, so much of it is about. Paul, you remember towards the end of it, he says, so you'll need to arm up, you'll need to equip yourself, you'll need to take advantage of all that God has given you to keep the fires burning and to keep resisting the opposition, whether it comes from world, flesh or devil, and to keep love alive. 30 years later, the Apostle John, many believe actually he spent some time in Ephesus, he's on in exile on the island of Patmos, you remember the story. He's given this open vision, we now call it the book of Revelation, last book in the Bible. And you might recall that there's a message there to the church in Ephesus, same church, 30 years later, and it goes like this, Revelation 2. I know your deeds, Ephesian church, I, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you can't tolerate wicked people, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but aren't and you found them false. You've persevered, you've endured hardships for my name, and you've not grown weary, yet I hold this against you. And I don't know about you, but if you consider that those words come from the living, loving God, they're quite chilling words, actually. I hold this against you, said in love, but said with force. You've forsaken the love you had at first. You have forsaken the love you had at first. You've lost your first love, actually. There's plenty about you that's really commendable. This church had served and ministered and faithfully gone about its business and, and uh, sought to witness to the, to the truth and had tried to preserve doctrinal purity and, and, and not to be deceived by false teaching and, and infiltrators and all that sort of thing. But God is saying there's fundamentally, fundamentally something at root really awry here, something incredibly significant, even more important to me, to Jesus, than a load of other good qualities and attributes that you've got. Why? Because it's the first thing, even before ministry and serving and stuff like that, and that first thing has gone missing. You've lost your first love, actually. <coughs> Friends, this morning, please don't hear me uh, speak that critically over us. It's not for me to judge our hearts at all. I'm not saying that. I'm not making a direct line equation. Not suggesting it's true of us, but I am convinced and convicted myself at the start of this year of one profound bit of hunger in me. I may not be hungry for many things, but I, I'm hungry for this. I want to love God more. I do want to love God more. I want us to love God more. I want us to have first things first. I want us to be a people of first love, actually. I want us to know far more of the depths of his love for us and to grow far deeper in the way that we then love him. Why is the foundation of our lives as life-changing for us and for others and all those who encounter us? And so John's revelation for the Ephesian church goes on to say a couple of practical things and I just want to explore these quite briefly. Headlines, really. You know them, but good to be refreshed and to take them away. To recapture, to, to grow something back of first love. So uh, it goes like this, the next verse. Remember from where you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. That's the prescription from heaven for those whose first love has diminished. Where the edge has come off, a first love for God. 
of first things first. Remember from where you've fallen, repent and do the things you did at first. So three things, remember. Remember where you've fallen from. Remember where your first love was. It may be that you are here this morning and you feel that your love for God has never been hotter. You are in that place where your love for God is as good as it has ever been. It's as uh, passionate as it's ever been. And you're in that place and praise God that you are. We rejoice and celebrate with you and let, let that love out. Let, it's already expressing itself because that's, if that's where you are, it cannot help but overflow into the lives around you. Your family will have noticed. Your work colleagues will have noticed. Uh, your prayer life will be in a good place. You'll be uh, in a good place. It may be that you're here this morning and you're still exploring Christian faith. You're, you're here and you're not sure about church or God or what all these weird people are doing here or the songs that we've sung or the character like me standing saying these kind of things. You are so welcome. Let me first say that. You are so, so welcome. We're all on a journey to, to, to some extent or another of getting questions answered and exploring. Keep exploring will be my thing. Maybe though the idea of encountering the love of God is not something that you'd ever sign up to, let alone the idea of personally loving a God that you can't see. I want to commend the Alpha course again to you. David mentioned it earlier, starting in a couple of weeks' time. Great place to keep exploring. But I'm guessing that there's many, many in the room who identify with this. I would love for my love of God to be deeper, stronger, higher, wider. Amen? I, bet, I just know that there are. You may even identify with the notion of first love, actually, having somehow got tarnished, have somehow been diminished. There's something that's got overlaid, and it's not easy to re-grab that thing that you might call your first love. Not suggesting that there's no love for God, but the quality has gone down, the passion's diminished, affection has reduced, a bit like the Ephesians here. And I can identify with that many, many times in my life. I've been on the Christian road a long time. I can think back to many occasions. I can read my journal with a certain amount of discouragement in, in times and seasons where I just know that my love has gone cold. Just know that the, the fire, such as it was, has died down to um, a low ebb and I feel distant. Might even have continued doing good things. Might even have continued kind of going through the motions and, and rightly having practices which are helpful. But I just know my heart of hearts, first love actually ain't there. It doesn't actually matter how good our practices are in the end important as they are, whatever past victories we might have had, whatever truth we might know and believe, actually we can't be in close relationship, can we? We can't enjoy close relationship unless we're walking in that place of love. I can't say to Hills, well, um, I'm going to continue to share the same house as you and uh, I'll continue to um, put the bins out when I remember, not always great at that. Um, I might even clean the fridge from time to time. We'll, we'll share the same bed, I'll parent the children, um, I'll continue to meet, eat, eat meals and, and pay the bills and so on, um, but actually I'm not going to love you. That's not intimate relationship, is it? There's something more than all of those things that are expressions of love or can be, but there's something above and beyond and beneath that, which is first love. First love, actually. Christian living is not this dry transaction. It grieves the Lord when we lose affection for him. God is a jealous God, a jealous lover. We're going in the, next, in the series over the next few weeks. We're going to be reminding ourselves of some of the attributes of God and do we know him in that way? And one of them is jealous. A jealous lover, do we know him as that? One who seeks after our affection and craves it and is jealous for it. There was a story of a man who had lost his, uh, who um, wanted to recover first love, and he heard of an old saint who appeared never to have lost his love for, for Jesus. And he went to this guy and he said, How, What makes you different? How come you appear not to have love, uh, lost your first love for, for Christ? And the man said, Let me tell you a story. I was sitting here one day with my dog, and suddenly a large white rabbit ran across the road, and my dog started after it, jumped up and took off after the rabbit and chased the rabbit over the hills with a real passion. And soon, some other dogs, hearing the barking, joined in and joined this dog chasing the rabbit. But after a while, those other dogs that had started chasing, they began to drop off and decided not to. My dog continued to chase the rabbit until he got there. That is the answer to your question. And the young man looked a bit puzzled. What do you mean? That's I asked you why you hadn't lost your first love for Jesus. And the, guy, and the man said, yes, well, why didn't the other dogs continue on the chase? And the answer is because they hadn't seen the rabbit. It was my dog that had seen the rabbit. It was my dog that had been up close and personal. And he had seen the prize. 
And there was enough about that encounter for him to pursue it for all he, he was worth. And I just want to remind us, church, and he, actually he went on to say to that young man, he looked him in the eyes and he said, young man, have you seen the prize? Have you met Jesus Christ? Have you had personal experience and encounter with the love of God in Jesus? Because once you've tasted, you'll continue to go after the prize. Is that passion becoming ingrained in your soul? It's why we talk about presence so much. It's why we talk about encounter and experience. It's why they matter. No amount of propositional truth does that. The Bible itself says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste is about experience. Sure, experience then needs to be worked out in all kinds of ways. Experiences can go up and down. I get that. But this is a a, a God who has made himself known to be known, a love to be known. And so, yes, mercifully, I can look back in my journal, in my experience, at those times and places where God gently has breathed his Holy Spirit and the fire has been reignited. And I do get back in touch with something of a first love, something of the the depth of that first encounter, the excitement of knowing, wow, I'm loved. I'm known by the King of Kings. He knows my name personally. He calls me Tim. He loves me. He's got plans and purposes for my life. He chooses even to dwell within this fragile heart here and broken and wants to make it more restored. I've known times like that, and there's nothing more thrilling. The king of the universe calls you to encounter. Remember your first love. The next two are much quicker. Repent, he says. Repent, sure. Repent includes getting on our knees. Sure, it means conveying sorrow for our neglect, for where we've allowed stuff to get in the way of our love for God of our love for Jesus, absolutely, the weakness of our affection. But it goes further, you know that, repentance goes further than just sorrow and conveying that. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a change of thinking, it's a turning around, it's, a, it's an asking and identifying what's got in the way here, what's, what have I allowed to get in the way of purer love for Jesus, where have I put my affections? Do I need to repent of busyness? Do I need to repent of apathy? Do I need to repent of some kind of idolatry? I've put uh, something in that place on the throne. Have I subtly allowed relationship to become religion? I saw a sign once in Paris next to a park, uh, in, in a park next to a beautiful flower bed. The sign was in three languages, I remember. In German, my German was rudimentary, but I knew it well enough then. For the, the sign in German said this, picking flowers is prohibited. The sign in English said, please don't pick the flowers. The sign in French said, if you love flowers, you won't pick them. And I remember God speaking to me at that time, actually. I was a young man. I remember him speaking about my motivation in faith. This thing, what am I bringing? Where is my heart in this thing we call Christian faith and towards the Lord? Is it based on duty and obligation? Picking flowers is prohibited. It's about rules. Was it based on the approval of others, what they might think, making God happy, making others happy? Please don't pick the flowers. Or actually, was there a heart connection to this God who loves me so much? And my response is to love back. Of course, if I love flowers, I won't pick them. Challenging. Too easy for us to drift towards religious behavior, to tick some Christian boxes. Jesus says, sure, the the obeying matters. Absolutely, the the following through what I call you to matters. If you love me, though, if you love me, you'll do what I say. How are we getting on? Are we taking our temperature at the beginning of 2017? the level of our passion. Remember, repent, think different. Third, redo. Do the things that you did at first. That's where he ends in this verse. When you first experienced the Lord and your world began to be turned around, if that's your experience, and your heart came alive. We sang it this morning. My heart came alive. You awake, your love awakened me and my heart came alive. What, what did you find yourself doing? What did you find yourself praying? Where did you find yourself running? You couldn't get enough. You opened your Bible, you prayed. You couldn't find enough people to tell about this new friendship. Redo some of those things, says God to the Ephesians whose first love actually had diminished. There are some habits, there are some practices, there are some things that fuel and express love. So if you're in that place, church, this morning, and you're sitting there going, I want 2017 to be a year when, I, when my love is revived, I want to start as I mean to go on, I want to allow for the roots of God's love to grow deeper in my heart, there are some things to do. Not as a religious exercise, but as things that fuel the fire. We love fires. We have the privilege of a real fire at home. We've enjoyed many of them over this Christmas period. There's a slight sense of competition in the family, frankly, as to who makes the best fire. It's me. (laughs) But a fire ain't no good without 
logs on it, without fuel for the fire. Even as I say this, I'm thinking that there's the air that comes down the chimney. We need to keep the chimney in good order. Maybe that speaks something about the wind of the Spirit that is also required, the oxygen of the Spirit, his part in igniting the fire. But our, our role to put some logs on the fire, what do those logs represent for you? Good, pra- good practices, good habits, things that we need to do in order to facilitate and make room for the ignition of the love of God in our hearts. There's a bunch of them on the screens. They're not rocket science. You've seen them before. Things like spending time. Hey, which relationship works well? Which love relationship works well without time given to it? You show me any. There are none. It needs time, focused time, devoted time. We know this. How is your time? What resolutions are you making in that area? What ri- as you survey the rhythms of your week and your month and your life at the moment, You've planned some time for the gym. You've thought about exercise. You've thought about diet. You've thought about a whole bunch of things. What about these things? Where do they fit? Bible. Have you got got decent apps? Have you got good notes? Fantastic resources available for all of us. Requires some planning. Prayer. Be real in prayer. What's your prayer life like now? What are you putting in place for that? Journal. Not great at this, I've got better in the last few years, but those who write their stuff, writing it down, the Bible, the, the Word of God itself says, write it down. Why? Because we're people of porous memory, like a calendar in my case. All stuff goes through. If a journal helps me hang on to some things, worship, worship music, worship, choosing to worship God in different ways. Reading. Are you a reader? I'm not a great reader. I'm one of my little resolutions to read a bit more. Whole books all full of great stuff. Receiving ministry. When was the last time you allowed somebody to pray for you? You want your love to grow deeper? There's some stuff in the way, some blockages between you and God and the kind of love that you want. Maybe you just need to get somebody to pray for you as part of that. Maybe if it's a tough blockage, maybe you just need the help of God via somebody else to to help you. What about Sozo ministry? I think there's a queue. I'm delighted to say there's a queue for Sozo at the minute. That's fantastic. That says to me there's a bunch of people who are hungry for breakthrough. Is that, are you one of them? You hungry for that? Do you come up here regularly on a Sunday? Do you take advantage of the opportunity every week here, let alone in life groups and other places, to receive hands-on prayer? There's something special about hands-on prayer, by the way, something biblical about it. Laying on of hands, it's a method. God ordains that. Fellowship, are you part of a group? Hope that you are. We can't be Christians alone. Hanging out with joy carriers. What's the company that you keep? There's something infectious, is there not? About those who are full of the Spirit of God. Those who are already brought alive by his love. Those who are in a place of fire. Go and catch the fire by hanging out with some of them. Two things are certain as I finish. The enemy will try and stop. Any resolution that you look at that list, you go, yeah, I'm going to try and do that. I'll try and do that. As soon as you make that declaration before God and yourself, the enemy will try to stop you and throw a whole bunch of distraction your way. Guaranteed. Tomorrow morning? Absolutely. So there's a certain level of discipline required. But what's God given us? I've given you a spirit of love, power, and self-discipline. Exercise it. Let's encourage one another. That's for certain. The enemy will try and stop you. And, And unless you're intentional, it won't happen. There's something about our own intentionality here. And sure, we might fail and fall, but unless we start... Not a lot will change. Friends, what's more important to chase after than this, this year? Love first, actually, as a response to his love for us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, says the Lord who loves us. First things first. Love first. All-embracing call. Every, every, every cupboard of my life, therefore, is open to the, the spring cleaning of God. Every relationship is touched. Every desire is touched. Every dream is touched. Every bit of my life and lifestyle is touched. The way that I think about my money and use it, the way I think about my friends, the way I think about my work, the kind of TV that I watch, the kind of films that I allow to pass through my eyes, the kind of conversations I have, the way that I parent my kids and parent my elderly parents. All of it touched and embraced and influenced by the love of God. It's a covenant love that we're called to for our sake, for the sake of the world. Wholehearted, life-encompassing, community-impacting as a people full of the love of God. Exclusive commitment to the loving Father, Son, and Spirit. First 
love actually. That's my word for today. Let's stand.